All right, now we are, I'm going to introduce our second speakers. Uh, we have two guests from the Cooper Hewitt today. Rachel Eve Ginsberg is a creative strategist and experienced designer exploring the relationship between information systems, interaction design, and sense making. She is the founding director of the Interaction Lab at Cooper Hewitt, a research and development program charged with exploring the next wave of museum experience. And it's really incredible if you have not been there, just explore that. Um, it's well worth it. Uh, in her artistic life, Rachel makes interactive experiences that drive self-discovery and personal transformation. Her work has been programmed at New York Film Festival, Sundance Film Festival, and International Documentary Festival, Amsterdam. Following Jessica Walthau, who will be joining, um, joining us as well. She is a conservator at Cooper Hewitt, working with both the product design and decorative arts and digital collections. Her current work investigates conservation theory and practice across traditional media and digital collecting. Recent work includes conservation in the digital age in collecting in the 21st century from museums to the web, uh, which is forthcoming in 2022, and con conserving active matter in contemporary design, which will be in living matter, the preservation of biological materials in contemporary art, um, which is Getty in May 2022. So it's a big year with a lot of publications coming out, Jessica, very nice. So um, without further ado, are we fixing a few things here? Great. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Ginsburg. Thank you so much, Jesse. Wow, speaking in front of an audience. <laughs> Novel. <laughs> it's really nice to see you all. Thank you so much to the Bard Graduate Center for having me, for inviting Jess and I to speak. Um, so what we're gonna speak about kind of broadly is this idea of transforming museum experience, which really, it's interesting because in the in the process of sort of the various places that this phrase has appeared, there has been conversation about the grammar of it. Oftentimes transforming museum experiences is what comes up, but the idea is really writ large. If we think about museum experience itself as a concept, what does it mean to transform it? Um, and when I was thinking about how to introduce this presentation, I realized that I don't think that I could do it better than the introduction to the toolkit um, that kind of explains this in depth. So I'm just gonna read that. Um, Museums can be vital spaces that manifest knowledge, dialogue, human creativity, history, and learning through their architecture, collections, programming, and organizational structures. But critical examination reveals many barriers challenging museums' ability to become relevant participants within our communities, often due to legacy approaches and systemic structures that provision how we collect, present, and fund our organizations. The practical financial and social impacts of the coronavirus, alongside a national reckoning with racial injustice, has increased the urgency to address why, how, and for whom museums exist in the 21st century. For museum professionals, this pivotal question raises another. How might we transform our collective approach to designing museum experiences to better reflect the diverse communities we serve? So, the kind of core question really at the heart of this and something just for all of you perhaps to consider as Jess and I are speaking is how and why do you individually as humans, as you know, practitioners potentially as uh, museum visitors believe museum experience should transform. And also making note that this question doesn't really create space for the idea that it shouldn't. <laughs> so certainly um, it's, to some degree a hot take because there are definitely people who don't believe that it needs to. I personally do, um, both as a practitioner and as, as a visitor. Um, and I think probably the, the best place to start is to give you a little bit of background on the Interaction Lab, to sort of understand the context, and then we can dive a little bit more into this question. Please, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so. The Interaction Lab is a research and development program reimagining museum experience for our rapidly changing times. Uh, the image that you're seeing on screen right now is actually my hand <laughs> holding a little kind of prop remote control that came out of one of our early workshops. This was in 2019, where we were kind of exploring different ways of interacting with the museum and different ways of using storytelling to chart a path through the museum. So the sketches that you're seeing in the background are all concepts and ideas based on that same, same approach. 
The premise of the Interaction Lab is to really interrogate the idea of interaction, not innovation per se. Um, certainly innovation is part of it, but really the goal is to consider the visitor experience as many uh, kind of sum of many interactions across touch points. And so focusing on interaction as the most essential unit of visitor engagement seemed like a really good place to start when trying to bite off the huge project of reimagining an entire visitor experience. Um, and so it was important for us. So, so uh, Carolyn Royston and I co-founded the Interaction Lab in kind of early 2019. Carolyn has now departed Cooper Hewitt and is working at the Brooklyn Museum. They're lucky to have her. Um, but we recognized at the time that, you know, initiating a program that was meant to bring about transformation, though we weren't necessarily using the word transformation at the time, um, it was really important to identify a, a, a shared ethos and values around what it is that we were going to do with the work. And so kind of these four points really capture that ethos. So first being designed with and for, so not just designing for people, but actually including the folks who were intending to serve with the designs that we're creating to, in, to participate in the process. The second is transparency and openness and not just transparency versus opacity, but this idea that organizations, many of them, museums included, like to solve our problems behind closed doors, which is understandable. We like things to be perfect. We like them to feel very coherent once we've launched them. But I mean, especially as being a part of the Smithsonian at Cooper Hewitt, the opportunity to really think about the museum as a site for design that we should invite people to participate in as opposed to just a thing that we do on our own and then present the results of to our audiences seemed really appropriate. And so on that note, this idea of generous radical collaboration, radical in the sense that it's very deep and expansive and invites people in a kind of deep, profound way to participate and generous in the sense that we recognize that there's a lot of jargon and there's a lot of kind of insider stuff about museums. So it's really important to make sure that in inviting people, we were actually giving them enough information to participate fully and not to sort of be sidelined by not being insiders. And then lastly, and I think being a design museum, this was such a tremendous opportunity is this idea of cross-disciplinary thinking. So actually inviting many kinds of design practitioners into conversations about museum practice. And one of the things that I've been most excited about is really drawing lines between the, the wide range of design practice that intersects with museum practice. It's this idea of information design and its relationship to interpretation or, and how storytelling comes into that mix, thinking about spatial design, thinking about you know, mix and extended reality Reality, all of that has a place inside of the museum, as Sophie was talking about, um, because it's going to have an increasingly significant place in our world. And so, of course, it should also have place in museums. And then the imagery that you're seeing on this slide is kind of a range of in-person and online workshops. So the in-person stuff is fairly obvious, lots of people sitting around tables <laughs> working on big things together. And then the online stuff on the top right, that was an image from our first online public program, actually part of a series called Pandemic as Portal. Um, so also based on that same Arundhati Roy article that Sophie talked about. And then uh, on the bottom, this kind of big board of post-its, this was actually what we gen one of the pieces that we generated from that collaboration. It's an, a, an online whiteboarding software called Miro. And actually all of that material is still available to look at if you're curious about what we talked about. We'll talk about that after. So we already sort of had this transformation agenda as it were prior to COVID, but then of course <laughs> COVID happened. And I think, you know, I, in putting together this talk, um, I, I had the occasion to think about this like moment in the pandemic, which I realized like quite past, but it was a really profound moment in the first like six months or so, this idea that all of us who had been advocating for new ways of doing things, like it was our moment. <laughs> like There was nothing else to be done. What had been happening was not possible anymore. And so there was this really profound moment of opportunity. Um, and I mean, I felt it and a lot of my collaborators and also in different fields felt it, but those of us who really been like pushing at the edges of wanting things to be different, all of a sudden the light was kind of shining on us. And we were like, okay, everybody like step up to the stage, it's your time. 
And so this, uh, this came out in, I believe it was the November, December 2020 issue of Museum Magazine from AAM, but we actually wrote it earlier in the year, like I think June, July. And so we really were thinking a lot about this idea of transformation. And so the question, how might we transform, seemed to be the most interesting provocation because certainly you know, I mean, as I said, I feel strongly that there's a lot of space for museum experience to transform, but I actually have no interest in being prescriptive about what other people think about that. And so I, the opportunity to have that discussion, to initiate that discussion was really exciting. And so in thinking about kind of mechanics of what transformation can look like, and thinking also about where I'm sitting in an organization, which is really about designing kind of audience facing experiences. And in that sort of running at the edges for change kind of moment, but realizing that, and you know, there was all of this like upheaval and tumult in the museum sector, people were organizing, people were speaking out about, about work practices that were deeply problematic, but there was this, also this feeling of needing to wait for change to filter down from the top, like needing to, you know, like pushing, pushing, pushing so that leadership would make these changes and that somehow those changes would move from the top down. But the reality is that what defines museum experience is the way that people interact with museums and actually practitioners who work close to audience have a profound capacity to transform that. And so this idea that transforming museum experience actually just means, just means, but can mean transforming the way museums interact with and build relationships with staff audiences and communities. And so all of a sudden, this idea of sort of flipping that on its head. So if, if what you're saying is transforming the way people experience the museum actually transforms the museum. And so this opportunity, I mean, and a lot of the work that Sophie was showing also this idea that we can in fact introduce new ways of interacting with the museum, which itself has the potential to transform the museum from the ground up. So we don't necessarily have to wait for those priorities to trickle down from the top. And so we had, Carolyn and I had applied for a grant from the Crest Foundation like right <laughs> at the beginning of the pandemic and knew that we wanted to do some professional development but weren't totally sure how we were going to do that at the time. And obviously had the space to rethink it once <laughs> COVID hit and the world changed. And so what we really were excited about doing was this opportunity to convene a non-hierarchical group of museum professionals rather than to do professional development in this way that presumes that the teachers and the learners are not at the same level because the teachers have things to teach and the learners don't somehow, which is silly because we're all doing this work. Um, we saw an opportunity to convene a cross-disciplinary group to actually have these conversations about what we think is critically important in transforming museum experience. And so I am going to check my paper to make sure I don't forget any anyone, but we invited, well, me plus 14 <laughs> uh, museum professionals who are working across curatorial education, audience research, public programming, public engagement, visitor services, exhibition design, digital and accessibility to come together and explore this question of how and why we believe museum experience should show us from. And this slide that's been up for a while for all of those people. So this is these are my incredible co-authors of what ultimately generated a toolkit, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, and it was really important to us to invite a, a wide range of people in terms of diversity of all kinds. So backgrounds and, and skill set and work, but really thinking about everybody coming from a place where we're doing some kind of audience facing work in a museum context. And some of these people, by the way, were um, and in the Smithsonian, others outside and others all still were independent consultants. So really like, like reaching for as wide of a range as we could. Um, so, the toolkit itself and the process that we underwent was essentially a process of co-design. Um, so that design within four that we were talking about earlier, which was first to establish a set of individual and shared values. Um, so how do we as individuals feel and how did we as a collective feel? Um, then to ask key questions of the topic and then to identify tools and approaches for taking action. Um, and so we did that over six, 
let's see, six, four and a half hour sessions. I'm like, I don't remember it was two years ago. <laughs> Thank you notes. Six, four and a half hour sessions. Um, each practitioner presented an individual presentation on a tool that they thought was useful. And it was really sort of this lightly facilitated conversation that was quite emergent actually. And so you'll see like, this was where we were documenting it all together. The image here is, is from our Miro board. Um, and so these sort of, as we moved through the workshops, we were having these different conversations and collaboratively documenting those conversations here. And then the content of those conversations is ultimately what generated the toolkit. The toolkit. So what you're seeing now is the cover and then each um, of the cover pages for the six sections of the toolkit. Um, and I'm just gonna go into a few of those in depth just to share a little bit more information. It's, I think it, we clocked in at like 72 pages. This is free and available online. Um, you, probably the easiest way to find it is just Google tools and approaches for transforming museum experience. It's a, it's a little bit hard to navigate to on the Cooper Hube website right now, unfortunately. We're sort of in process of re reimagining that. Um, so the first section of, of the toolkit, well, the first section I'm gonna go into depth about is this, is this idea of a call to action. So we thought that it was really important as a group to share our values in driving museum work, but rather than sharing our values as like, a, this is what we think, what do you think? Um, Kaylee Bryant Greenwell, who's one of our co-authors suggested that we, we kind of reframe it as a call to action. So inviting people to think about, interrogate, work with these, these eight values that we synthesized out of the conversations that we had in the workshops. And so I'll just read through them quickly. Um, and again, they're, they're imperative and they were intentionally framed as imperative statements because we, as a group of 15 people, believe very strongly that this was what was necessary. Um, so the first is museums can and must change. The second is people, not objects, are the vital spirit of museums. Number three, museums need radical leadership. And in this case, what we meant by radical and explained in the toolkit was people who are willing to break with the status quo of museum practice to do what's best for the institution and also what's best for communities and to find the comfortable space, ooh, and maybe not so comfortable space between those two things. Um, <laughs> number four, museums are incomplete and that's a good thing. So rather than trying to be exhaustive, recognizing that we don't actually, we're not the sum total of all knowledge and that by engaging in meaningful conversation with communities, we can really explore that. Um, museums are accountable to communities, um, pretty self-explanatory. Museums must address and revise our problematic histories and relationships with power. Took a while to get to that phrasing, but I feel good about it. <laughs> um, museums must take responsibility for making all aspects of the experience accessible and inclusive. And in this case, what was critical mostly in the phrasing of this is this idea for, of taking responsibility for doing that and really claiming and owning that responsibility on the part of the institution. And then lastly, museums should be relevant. Um, and that's kind of a tough one because it can mean lots of different things. And certainly the word relevant gets thrown around a lot. So um, there is more explanation in the toolkit, but I would say that the important piece of this is that we need to define relevance somehow, um, that it's critical to do so, even though there may be different definitions of that. The next is this section on tools for thinking, which is really about framing design questions. So this how might we construct, so the how might we transform is uh, that question for those of you who aren't familiar is framed, there, the, the how might we framing is a pretty common way of question asking in design practice. And it really creates a kind of expansive space of possibility as opposed to how will we or how should we, which are sort of viability questions or imperative questions. Um, and what you'll find in every section is a kind of, there's a couple essays on what the point is and then some content. So this one is sort of about what are design questions? Here are some design questions that we think are interesting and also how you might use design questions in your own practice to advance the work that you're doing, whatever that work may be. And then lastly, um, tools for doing. And tools for doing are is the sort of meat of the toolkit part. So it's really a quite lengthy list of short summaries of different kinds of tools. Um, and there is the intro essay is called A Case for Embedding Research and Development into Museum Practice. So first of all, why should you do this kind of kind of nimble development work? 
And then um, what's really at the kind of the core of this section, and it, it is sort of the heart of the toolkit really, is this idea of a transformative framework for working, which I'm going to dig into in just a sec. Um, and then lastly, transformative practice was summaries of those 15 tools that all the practitioners presented. So when thinking about transformative work, um, how do you define <laughs> this idea of transformative work? Well, in this case, um, the idea is a transformative project is a project that intends to create a lasting transformation in how a museum does its work. So you're not just introducing new kinds of things, new products, new services, new experiences, but you're also introducing new process or new cultural values to hopefully transform in a, in a lasting way how the museum actually does that thing that you're doing. Um, and so going back to this transformative framework for museum work in Tools for Doing, um, there are three sections. One is interventions. So what we make, right? It's a product, it's a service, it's an experience, it's an environment, it's a program, it's a piece of content. <laughs> um, I think that's all of them. There might be more. Uh, workflow is how we make and how we collaborate. So you're designing workflow process. So the question about like, how does content get made in the Met? Like what a nightmare <laughs> because there's probably 25 million ways that that happens. Um, and then culture is really about the values that drive the making overall. So what we make, how we make it determines the, the culture. And, and that is a multi-level framework that you can start from any place inside of it and move. So, so this idea that we're waiting for top-down transformation or we're initiating bottom-up transformation, this is a way of sort of systematizing that and thinking about where you exist inside of it as a practitioner. So if you exist in the place where you're designing interventions, most often those are designed by staff that are closest to audiences. So you have a lot of control over how museums intervene or interact with audiences. Whereas workflow could be designed by process owning staff, could be leadership driven or not. So there's a kind of intermediate place where depending on who and how they function inside the museum can have, can have sort of control over that. And then culture, which is oftentimes designed by leadership, and de facto practice. And that little intention or neglect parentheses <laughs> is sort of the implication of sometimes it's really designed on purpose and sometimes it's really not designed on purpose, but it's almost never not designed. So taking responsibility for the, the potential to design culture is important. And so the next stage um, of this work after the toolkit was published, we published it in March of 2021. Um, it is free and available online, as I mentioned. Um, we wanted to continue kind of exploring and expanding the impact of the toolkit. And so thank you again to the Samuel Crest Foundation. Um, they supported us again with a grant to offer a series of workshops. And so we did, um, we, we launched an open call uh, for participants and folks from a kind of like, I mean, quite a wide range of institutions actually on the right. So we did these last fall on the right is the range of institutions that participated in the workshops. Um, a couple of people are here today who are in the cohorts and actually Jess will come up in a second. And that's sort of the, the, the synthesis of our work together that we're talking about today. Um, and the idea of these workshops was to not just invite folks to apply the ideas in the toolkit, but to create a really horizontal learning environment where everyone brought a project. And rather than the thing that often happens in workshops where you like bring your project and then the activity makes you merge your project with someone else's project. So you don't get to work on your project. And then you leave having done this sort of like straw person project, which is helpful, but not directly the thing that you needed to do. <laughs> we designed these workshops to not do that. So the idea was everyone brings their project everyone consults each other on the work. And so we have the opportunity to create a kind of community of practice, but that's all based on everyone's individual projects. And I have to tell you, I have had no more in inspiring experiences almost in my professional life, but definitely in my life in museums, like hearing about the incredible work <laughs> that all these people and institutions are doing. Um, and just, you know, acknowledging that. And, and, and you know, Sophie and I actually were talking about this um, before, we started the symposium that you know doing transformative work is really hard. It's it's tiring. It feels like you're pushing boulders up hills. Um, even people who could be allies, I think, feel initially oftentimes threatened by it because it's something that assumes that you're going to force them to do things differently. And so creating communities of practice around transformation is critical to kind of maintain the energy um, to actually do the work. So 
this was a really important step and I'm happy to say that it was really successful. Um, and so I am going to wrap for now and invite Jess Walsu up to finish this presentation, but thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much to BGC for hosting us today. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think I just want to pick up a little bit with where uh, Rachel went with this in the in the introduction. There is problem probably no one more obsessive about doing work behind closed doors until it is perfect and coherent than in our conservator. And I want to say that I think. The reason I was so interested in doing this work with Rachel and being part of this transforming museum experience cohort was really to push myself out of my comfort zone and to really try to understand a little bit better if we are going to do progressive work in museums, it can't just be public programming, it can't just be education, it can't just be visitor experience, it needs to trickle down into the entire museum culture and for those of us that work directly with collections, sometimes that's a really big distance from our audiences. So my part of, my part of the presentation is gonna talk about this idea of transformative stewardship, which involves more than just collections and their conservation, but again, gets at this idea of how the interventions that we make can also transform the culture of what we are doing. And it, it, at its heart, it really looks at what is stewardship in the, this more broad construction beyond conservation. So this is uh, the project that I brought to this workshop with um, my very close collaborator, um, Andrea Lips, who is also a co-author of this talk, but is not here today. Um, Andrea is the curator of our digital collection and I work with our digital contractor and an internal working group to help steer our conservation ethos, I would say, around the idea of these new, um, new media and burgeoning collections in the museum. So cats, Collections Access and Transformative Stewardship takes the premise of presentation as preservation toward the stewardship of our born digital collection. That means that to ensure the long-term stewardship of our digital works, we plan to present them in a way in which curators and conservators and the public can investigate, explore, test, and experience the works. The premise of this is that the only way to ensure these works remain functional is to let people use them. And this is essentially the polar opposite of the preservation strategy for more, mater more traditional materials that we display carefully on platforms, under vitrines, out of harm's way while they're on exhibit, or stored away from view in museum storerooms. Which are, these are the classic ways in which conservation is involved in the preservation of cultural heritage. So CATS looks beyond collections to think harder and hopefully more collaboratively about access, which is really a huge key component here, and this, again, much broader sense of stewardship. And I'm gonna sort of make the point through some case study examples in our digital collection of why the digital collections themselves are ripe for this kind of investigation and how the collections also create sort of an imperative for this type of practice. So what is it about digital collections? Why are they provoking us to rethink our procedures and our priorities? Well, they're an extremely small proportion of the collections at Cooper Hewitt. We have over 215,000 objects and less than 100 objects that we consider digital. Although that's a little complicated, the number of objects, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, but first, this primarily this idea of stasis versus change. So if, if traditional conservation is really about us minimizing change, and if you wanna talk about that, go see BGC's beautiful new exhibition opening today, Conserving Active Matter. But if traditional conservation is about us minimizing change, digital works, completely turn this on its head. Second, many of our works in our design collection are interactive and performative, which changes both the nature of what we're seeking to conserve and how we frame the actions of conservation. And last, because many of these works are complex and interdependent, this introduces both this really terrifying level of fragility and precarity, but it also arguably makes it so that these works cannot be preserved, confined within the bounds of a museum. So I'm gonna give a little more background on the digital collection and some of the, the works in the collection that have really helped me reframe my whole thinking around preservation and what this might mean in terms of some more expanded idea of stewardship. So our digital collection is not yet a formal department in the museum and its scope and extent remain extremely small relative to the other departments that have been more long established. But we collect, just as a few examples, digital typefaces, emojis, icons, data visualization, animation, software, and websites. 
the collection's growing rapidly and we keep expanding all of these different new novel media that together make up contemporary digital design. And a few of the examples are here, the hijab emoji and inter-skin tone emojis, Cooper Hewitt's open source font that was designed for the museum's um, 2014 reopening, and then some pieces of interactive software, animation. It's really a very interesting group of objects. Um, we started collecting back in 2011, so it's been over a decade of collecting at the museum, but by 2015 or so, as more of these born digital acquisitions were entering the collection, it became apparent to the staff, and I wasn't yet on staff at the time, um, that the special needs of these born digital works were starting to emerge as concerns, and the museum didn't yet have a good sense of the extent of digital material in the collection, or how collections maybe of electronics might also have digital components like interfaces that weren't yet being explored and hadn't had any preservation attention. So with uh, help from the National Collections Program, the museum undertook a survey to understand um, digital material across the collection, which included the product design and decorative arts department. And you're seeing an example of a computer terminal here. Um, the full report is available on the small data website and it's about designing the future of design. And it was in itself as much a report describing the findings of the survey as, it's, as it was also speculative in its nature, thinking about the future of visitor experience and the future of physical installations in the museum and how we might engage digital content in different ways. Um, so this is where many of the ideas in this presentation began to germinate. And um, I think one of the major sort of takeaways here is how these the sort of short lifespans and short histories of the digital objects in our collection over just the past decade have really been completely transformative to our internal ways of thinking about the collections and not just the digital collections, but really expanded to understand a broader idea of what we might be doing in the museum. So the first acquisition in the born digital category was this Clearview font family, which was collected in 2011 on CD. And to my first point of preservation of digital works requiring change, um, this CD is not a stable medium in the long term. So these works need to be migrated for their preservation. So the font family was designed for better legibility and is used on highway and street signs, one of which you see at the right side of the screen. And here you can see sort of a an explanation of how increasing the white space around the letter forms increase the legibility from a distance. Here is the CD from which we migrated the digital files. Um, so migrating digital files to secure digital storage requires transfers and it, it multiplies the work, it changes the work. This one CD contained 81 different files, each of which is now tracked as an individual digital asset. So this introduces this idea of migration and proliferation that if objects need to be copied and changed and duplicated to survive, that's really a paradigm that differentiates digital works from the usual norms of conservation in which we're concerned with like the original material historic object. Here you can see also the full character set of one of the fonts in the family. Again, there are 81 in this particular group of acquisitions. Alongside the digital objects themselves, which may proliferate into many copies, each digital work in the collection also generates in parallel copious documentation an archive, which includes process material interviews and technical and descriptive documentation, which I'm showing sort of behind the scenes. That's the kind of documentation we create in conservation, which you see on the right. And I have to say, admittedly here, I'm describing perhaps one of the simplest works in the digital collection, right? Not so simple. Um, as we've built this collection over the past decade, things have gotten considerably more complex at kind of an alarming rate. Um, so trying to describe how the acquisition of interactive and performative works has pushed us to take things in a different direction. Um, our collections as, as a design museum are focused on users and user experience, even if that is something that doesn't necessarily trickle down into all areas of practice. Um, in 2021, we completed a multi-year process of acquiring the Smithsonian's first live website, which is the watercolor map tile site by Stamen Design, a San Francisco-based cartography studio. This web-based work was designed as a free and open source mapping tool to allow users to render or embed maps generated to look like hand-drawn watercolors, which you're seeing on screen. Here you see a map of the New York and New Jersey area with water rendered in aqua, streets and variations of orange over a tan background, and parks in verdant greens all modeled as if they were really the effect of paint on paper rather than complex image processing algorithms. Over the course of many conversations back and forth, we decided that the best and really only way to acquire this site was to create a duplicate version and host our own live version concurrently with the original site. 
We wanted to maintain its interactivity and performativity because the site was still being used by actually thousands of users when we decided to acquire it. And we didn't want this to end the life of the work through our acquisition. So we took on this idea of this parallel lives. Transferring the code and its assets uh, was no small undertaking because in total, the site needs 50, over 56 million image files to be cached and served to users to maintain its function. So like we were talking about one CD, 81 files, one website, more than 56 million files. <laughs> um, this required a close collaboration with Smithsonian's Office of the Chief Information Officer and was to be very honest, a very bureaucratic and difficult process. <laughs> The idea that the best choice and really the only way to really acquire and preserve the site was for us to take on the process of recreating the site and then keeping it live and interactive, which demands ongoing maintenance, was something that only emerged to us because of prior experience with another sort of star of our collection, the app Planetary. And this is a good example of how um, complex interdependent works really cannot even live in museum collections. So Planetary was an iPad app designed in 2011. It visualizes a user's music library as stars and planets. And it was downloaded more than 3 million times by the time it was considered for acquisition by the museum. When it was acquired, the process was driven by our then digital and emerging media team, Seb Chan and Aaron Strabko, who saw the acquisition of the Smithsonian's first source code as a really important landmark, but also as a provocation to demonstrate how ill-equipped the museum sector was at that time to consider the long-term stewardship of exceedingly fragile works like iOS apps. This is another example where we're sort of referring to the life of an object and referring to the idea of a work of digital media as some kind of living object. So in addition to printing out the source code and putting it in normal museum storage, which you see on the right, that box has a binder full of printed out source code, very useful. Um, the authors of the app agreed to a much more unusual approach. So the code for Planetary was also hosted on GitHub outside of the you know, auspices of the museum. This is a software repository management site, um, which permits users to read through and actually engage with source code and also lodge complaints, offer fixes, and understand the whole version history of a, of a work of code. So. Uh, once the app was acquired, the museum did not promise to maintain it, proposed that this idea of putting the code on GitHub would enable its crowdsourced conservation. I'm showing a screenshot of the collection-specific GitHub for some of Cooper Hewitt's digital works. It's admittedly a platform we haven't fully taken advantage of. Um, so GitHub enables users interested in looking under the hood to get a better understanding of how Planetary is built. And crucially, it also means that once the app breaks, which it did by 2014, there's a forum for people to discuss what was wrong and how it might be fixed. We did our own conservation assessment, and in 2017, our contractor Ben worked with Tom Carden, one of the original designers, on a plan to get the original code operational in a simulated environment. Shown here is a screenshot of the work running on a simulated iPad with iOS 5, so that it would be possible for us to demonstrate the program in an exhibition on a period iPad. So now there's the original version, maybe the simulated version. You can see that digital works can't stay still. They have to be constantly in motion here to be preserved. Um, this plan, the simulation, didn't actually update the app to current standards. So too bad for all of those 3 million users who were still hoping that someone was going to do something about this. But without plans to actually put this on display, the museum really had no justification to do further work. And a more full-scale conservation treatment would be needed, and it would require substantially rewriting areas of code. So really actually getting into the the material of the work and changing it significantly. So here's the pandemic silver lining story for you. In June 2020, we heard completely out of the blue from Kamal Enver, a software developer in Australia, that he had remastered the planetary app working from the code the museum had made available. Kamal's a software developer with years of experience in iOS development and was able to get this app working again on contemporary systems. And it's free and available to download it's on my cell phone. I'll happily show you at the break how it works. Um, this is a what we, we might term a decentralized and shared stewardship strategy. It's founded absolutely on one of these ideas of radical openness, um, quite unlike the museum fields and certainly the Smithsonian standard operating procedures. And all kudos go to Seb and Aaron for really pushing and going through the intellectual labor and also work with general counsel to make this sort of project happen in the first place. And then for maintaining faith that this kind of thing would happen. Until this happened, I had zero faith that there would be any sort of crowdsourced conservation of software because it's just something so complex and time intensive that there seemed to be, to me, no circumstances 
in which someone would devote their time and energy to getting this app working again, but I was 100% wrong. So these examples involve many people inside and outside the museum in preserving this work and challenge the idea that we only conserve works intermittently when they go on display, because I think everyone knows the majority of collections works are sitting in storage and only a very small proportion could ever be on display. So what if we could treat the whole digital collection with this amount of openness, this kind of access, and create this possibility of a shared model of stewardship? What would that be like? When we came to the TME workshop, we imagined this CATS project as a metaphorical community garden, a bit like Cooper Hewitt's actual garden, which provides a space and a structure for community engagement. And in this case, it would provide access to the collections. It would make transparent our issues around stewardship of code and these more difficult and complex assets. You know, all of the story that you see here is certainly not something that we typically share. It's not on our website. It's not, it's not in a gallery presentation of any of these works but their complexity is really what makes them interesting to us. And it's the users that use them that brings all of that to light. So this gardening metaphor had emerged during the work we, done, we had done with small data, and it relates to that framing of interactive works as living objects. But even this conceptual shift doesn't fully enable this whole transformative stewardship as we imagine it. Bringing our CATS project to the TME workshop to learn to employ the toolkit helped us re-envision this work in progress, but it also served to demonstrate real gaps in practice between these progressive frameworks and the role of conservation, which traditionally happens very much behind the scenes, out of view of audiences, and remains very single-mindedly focused on objects. So we wondered, by shifting our focus from collections to audiences, could this project, through preservation by presentation, open a pathway to transformative museum practice? And I think I would just reiterate that among the many intractable parts of museum culture that we've been examining since the pandemic sort of shook everything up, I'd say collections are perhaps the most difficult to make changes to. This work has provoked us to try to imagine a completely different future, a polarized approach to the norms of collection stewardship. And I would also say another silver lining of the pandemic is that Cooper Hewitt, which is um, one of the only Smithsonian's not in the you know, DC area, has now had a chance to be much more involved in pan-Smithsonian projects, thanks to the magic of Teams and Zoom. And I now know many people within the broader Smithsonian community trying to achieve similar aims to broaden access, to create inclusivity. Um, a real challenge for us is to connect the dots across this very, very large and very bureaucratic organization. And I'll take you on that one. The Met is only maybe a, a thousand people overall. I think Smithsonian has you beat. Um, so to bring in this idea of the accessibility office, the digital projects office, all of these big um, this wide net of resources and to really find parallels with shared stewardship practice across Smithsonian um, as it's practiced at places as diverse as the National Museum of the American Indian, the Anacostia Community Museum and the Center for Folkways. Um, it's a challenge, it's a challenge for us, but we look forward to sharing a prototype in the coming weeks and months of how we envision this project um, evolving. And um, thanks to Rachel for really giving us the courage to try to re-envision this process from the ground up and think about how this project needs to be built by co-design with the user community. So I wanna say a big thank you, especially to Carolyn Royston, our former chief experience officer, and to all of the people who've been involved in the authoring and um, community practice around the, the TME toolkit. Thanks to our funders, the Samuel H. Crest Foundation and also the National Collections Program at Smithsonian. And thanks to our collaborators, uh, big thanks especially to Andrea Lips and to Rachel, my co-authors, and also to our collaborator, Ben Fina Radden at Small Data Industries, who has helped us with both the tangible physical conservation of our collections, but also this really vivid reimagining of what it's possible to do. And thanks very much to Jesse and the BGC for the opportunity to work out loud here and present some work in progress. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have, oh, so we're on. Anybody have any questions for either Rachel or Jessica? This was really great to see the work in progress. So I, I really appreciate it. And also the difficulties and the problems and the challenges of thinking through digital preservation. It was really great to see a kind of totally different angle from some of the more material objects. So we have some question in the back, Amy. Yeah, hold on, I'll come to you. Thank you all. These were really wonderful presentations. Um, you alluded to this, I think, a little bit, each of you in your presentations, but I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to um, 
challenges and obstacles you face to doing these projects and particularly maybe taking them on during the pandemic, working from home, and if there were particular solutions that you found to be especially effective, whether it was software, um, staffing. Um, yeah, I'd just be curious to hear what kind of challenges you faced or, or maybe pushback you got and, and how you addressed it. Thanks. I can, yeah, I'll speak a little bit from my perspective and conservation is very um, focused on the safety of the physical objects in storage and on exhibit. Um, but when we stopped having exhibits in person, I had a lot more time to devote to my responsibilities to the digital collection. So a lot of my uh, intellectual engagement with the collection happened during this course of the last two years and was very much shaped by the idea of how transformative the digital environment is to the way we all work and live. So um, experiencing, you know, experiencing the world as a museum practitioner and really experiencing it as a person are sometimes, you know, two different lenses. But I think having seen the way that um, the fragility of these things is often brought up, but there's also a resiliency and things can actually be completely broken and then completely fixed again. And that wasn't something that I had so much faith in myself. So I think that was something that was quite transformative. Um, and then I'd also say that Rachel and I had not gotten work to work together and the Transforming Museum Experience whole project created opportunities to hear from practitioners in other museums, but also to get to know people working in the same museum in different ways in a, in a new light. Thanks, Jess. I would say actually, I mean, I was sort of standing here thinking like, what were the challenges? I actually think that the pandemic and working from home made the toolkit possible in a way that it actually probably wouldn't have been in quite the same way. Um, I mean, we were able to invite a wide range of people, both in terms of the co-authors and also of the, um, the cohorts. And also, I mean, we, you know, it was very important to, to pay everyone who is involved. So as the co-authors, like it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a huge grant. It was thank you again to the Crest Foundation, it wasn't a ton of money. So it wouldn't have flown 15 people to a space to have, you know, to have a conversation, certainly not had the ability to actually pay them. So there was that piece of things. And then again, with the cohorts, we, um, the list of institutions that you saw was over, I mean, across 19 time zones, not including 19 time zones, but like all the way from Australia to to Pacific time. Um, and so the ability to do something like that and to actually really, interact across barriers was incredible. And I would say, I cannot oversell Miro <laughs> as a tool. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of different digital whiteboarding softwares. Mural is also, Mural versus Miro, <laughs> complicated, also a good one. But I think being able to have a kind of endless digital space where people can actually make things together and be in conversation and use between Zoom and using breakout rooms in Zoom and inviting people and sort of, I, I don't know why I'm looking at this, like the slide is up there, but here, I'll just show you real quick. But like being able to actually advance design the board. So like before the workshops, actually putting the kind of worksheet style thing on the board so that when we went into workshop day one, there was already a framework there, much like you would do with like big butcher paper or sticky notes or whatever, like being able to do that in a digital space really made it feel actually not so different from a physical workshop. So that was really helpful. I also realized we're totally over time. So thank you again. <laughs> I'm just, Jesse handed me the phone. Microphone. I didn't just take it. Um, so um, I'm always interested in what's not said, and 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 therefore my ears perked up at the fact that this very large and fascinating project. You didn't mention the museum director or the senior administration once, and I'm wondering how your work sits inside of that larger ecology. I'll let me take this one. Yeah, do this one because I'm permanent staff. So um, we actually our new director has started this week. And we are delighted. Maria Nicancora has just started literally Monday. Uh, we have had no director for the entire pandemic. Um, our old director left in February of 2020. So with all the challenges that a museum leadership was facing, um, I think this is an example where that idea that change 
is transformative from the ground up as much as it comes top down. I mean, there's no more hierarchical organization than the Smithsonian. We're part of the federal government. Um, but I think a big, a big area of learning for us has been that the, the community of practice of the people that actually do the work in the museums is equally as much a source of the, the culture of the museum. And, and that's something that I don't think I really understood so much before, uh, before this work and before the pandemic. So, but yes, this is a ground up. This is a ground up kind of a thing for sure. Thank you so much.